Hello and welcome uh, to this webinar on the exciting new features in NRF Connect SDK version 2.2.0. Uh, my name is Bjorn Kvole. I'm a product marketing engineer at Nordic Semiconductor. And with me today, I have Tiago Monte, who's a developer marketing manager, as well as Ali Anjani, who's also a developer marketing manager. Uh, just some quick practicalities. I'll go through this quickly. You probably know it already. Uh, the duration will be roughly 50 minutes with a 10 minute Q&A. Questions are encouraged. Uh, please type the questions in the top of the right sidebar. You should see something similar to this. All questions are anonymous. Try to keep them relevant, and we will answer towards the end. The chat on the bottom right side is not anonymous and should not be used for questions. If you do have any more questions after the webinar, feel free to go to devzone.nordicsemi.com. And last but not least, a recording of the webinar will be available together with a presentation at webinars.nordicsemi.com slash on demand, on dash demand. So quickly on the agenda, we will do a quick intro to the NRF Connect SDK before we head on over to generic updates. We have some security updates and Bluetooth thread, Wi-Fi and Matter, and then cellular IoT. We also do have quite a few demos, so I hope you enjoy those. And then last but not least, we have the Q&A at the end. So what we want to do is we want to excite and support developers. So therefore, we have the webinars, which give technology intros and trainings, such as this one here. We have the Nordic Dev Zone, which is a tech support center and online community uh, number one uh, forum uh, in the embedded space for Bluetooth and LT. Um, roughly, I don't know, 50 engineers full-time engineers running the portal. Uh, we also have GitHub, multiple repositories, mainly in C, C++, but we do also have Python and JavaScript. And last but not least, the Dev Academy. So it's a great interactive online learning platform. And feel free to click on the links on the bottom. Um, so just a quick intro to the NRF Connect SDK. Uh, it is one code base and tool chain for the NRF 91 series, NRF 70 series, NRF 53, 52, and NRF 21 series. It is optional for the NRF 52 series as of version 1.3.0 of the NRF Connect SDK. It does include ANT, Bluetooth Low Energy, Wi-Fi, LTM, Narrowband IoT, GNSS, Bluetooth Mesh, Thread, Zigbee, Matter, ESB, Gazelle, and NFC. So all of the protocols we've had, we have, we support there. Uh, we do also do have a Bluetooth version 5.3 qualified host and controller stack since version 2.00 of the NRF Connect SDK. Without further ado, I'll let Ali talk about the generic updates in this release. Let's talk about NRF Util version 7. So we've made a major upgrade between version 6 and version 7 of NRF Util. NRF Util not only support NRF5 SDK DFU, it now also support JLink and MCU boot. So it's a unified command line interface to flash all Nordic devices, regardless if it's a development kit, a Thingy91, a Thingy53, a dongle, or your own hardware. The new upgrade in version 7 include all the previous functionalities of previous NRF utils which is basically support for DFU and package generation using different transport of, for uh, NRF5 SDK-based application. The syntax is kept the same. There are no need to change command line scripts. It's fully backward compatible. However, the new version includes support for programming prompts like JLink and MCU boot. So it has also support for NRF Connect SDK-based applications. Functionalities of NRF Util is provided through installable and up upgradable commands. We currently have three commands, the NRF5 SDK slash tools command, basically provide uh, backward compatibility with previous versions of NRF Util. So that's again, support for DFU and, pa and package generation for NRF5 SDK based application. While the device command, it uh, support uh, JLink and MCU boot. 
So it provides device management for Nordic devices, including devices discovery, flashing, and operations such as erase, reset, and recover. The completion command, or we can call it a subsystem, it provides a very nice auto completion and menus. So it makes interacting with the utility and finding available subcommands and flags very easy task as we will see in the demo next. Last thing I want to mention on this slide is that we no longer have to worry about Python specific version packages dependencies as NRFutil functionality is provided uh, as a binary file. For the demo, I have here three Nordic devices with different uh, programming capabilities. So I have the NRF52 A33 uh, development kit. It has a debugger, a JDIC debugger. And I have a Thingy921. There is no onboard debugger on the Thingy921. However, it has MCU boot uh, programming support. And there is the NRF52840 dongle. The dongle comes factory shipped with the NRF5 uh, bootloader. We will use NRFutil to uh, enumerate these devices, discover their features, and also to program a new uh, firmware image on all of them using NRFutil. Let me actually, before going to uh, to the program device, let me go to the directory where the binaries are for the new firmware. So I need to go to CD build uh, build and then I need to select a build one because the build one and then I need to go to the Zephyr folder because that is where the uh, executables are and then I can program it simply by another uh, device program and here of course I need to st specify the firmware this is usually uh, the Zephyr uh, dot hex uh, you can see nicely how the auto completion is helping me and here I can either say that uh, program any device with the traits uh, JLEX or I can specify the serial number. So let me just actually use the serial number option. So you can see in the tab I have the serial number and then the tab can also tell me uh, which device I need to select. And now enter and I have just uh, started programming for the uh, DK. Let's use NRF Util now to program the uh, thingy 921. So same same subcommand, which is NRF device program. But of course, I need to go. Uh, sorry, I need to go to the directory. So CD CD uh, and then CD. That's build one, build one, and then Zephyr. And then from here, I'll type NRF util. See, this is remembering the previous command, but it's going to be slightly different this time, uh, slightly different. So device, and then program, sorry, program, yes. And then uh, I will specify a firmware, uh, but this time it's um, it's the app. It's the app sign that hex. That's the one that you use for MCU boot. And then here, I can again either specify the serial number or the uh, or the trait. So let's uh, let's use the trait, which is you can see here. It's MCU boot. So let me just copy this one. I can say trait MCU boot. And of course, you need to make sure that your uh, thingy 91 is in DFU mode. And then now we're flashing uh, the Thingy91 with a new uh, application, which is the uh, threads that simply toggles LED1 and LED2 at different intervals. And lastly, once this is finished, I'll actually uh, program the dongle. And for the dongle, I will use the uh, NRF Util uh, features from version 6 backward. So for that, uh, I need to use the, uh, the, uh, the uh, so if we do NRF util list without device list, this will tell me the listed commands. And you can see we use the device, the completion will have been used throughout the uh, demo. The NRF 5 SDK tools has aliases. So these are all aliases for uh, the NRF 5 SDK tools. So we can use the same 
uh, previous uh, the same scripts that we used before for NRF util version 6 and version 7. So if we remember, um, let me actually actually first just go to this uh, directory. I can easily easily switch it from here. So I can just say start a new terminal here. And then let me just go to the Zephyr folder. And from here, what I need to do now is to actually um, uh, generate the uh, DFU package that's compatible with the five NRF five bootloader. So for that, you type NRF U, NRF util, yeah, and then uh, it's called PKG, and then generate, generate, and then the generate. If you type tab, there are uh, several things that you need to specify. First thing is the uh, hardware version and I'm targeting the 52 because that's the 52840 dongle and then I need to uh, specify an SD requirement the soft device requirement and we can just keep it uh, generic and then I need to uh, specify the uh, application In this case uh, it's going to be the Zephyr that hex this is all uh, available in the documentation of NRF Util. And then what's the name of my output and its version? So application version. And that will be, uh, you can just name it one, and then I can name it dot app dot zip. I'll use the, um, what do you call it? The built-in uh, uh, keys. So that's why I got these uh, warning. Of course, for production, you need to generate your own keys first. And now I can flash uh the new image using the nrf5 uh, bootloader on the dongle so nrf util and then this time i'll do dfu and let's see what available options in the uh, dfu not uh i'll use i'll use usb serial because it's connected over usb and then i need to specify the package package what's the package i just generated before it's called app Oh, sorry, it's app.zip. And then uh, I need to specify the uh, port or the serial number. So if I type, type, say it's serial number and tab, it will list me. Uh, this is the, the fir this is the thingy, this is the DK, and this one is the dongle. And then enter. And now we're flashing the uh, dongle with the a new firmware. And I can switch the camera now and you can see that all three devices have been programmed with the same uh, image, which is the uh, threads blinking the two LEDs at different frequencies. Let's switch gears from NRF Util to NRF Connect for VS Code. We have made several improvements to the debugging experience within the default debugger, which is NRF Debug. If we examine the thread viewer, we can see that the live stack usage per thread is displayed with bar graph. This is a vital piece of information that developers can use to optimize their application threads stack allocation. Also in the thread viewer, to the left of the name column, we can see some icons. These icons, they represent the state of each thread and they're based on Zephyr Arto's thread states terminology. So with this nice GUI, Developers can now know which thread is currently running, which threads are in the ready state, uh, which means they are ready for the scheduler to schedule them in once the current thread finishes is execution, and also know about waiting threads and suspended threads. You can hover the mouse uh, over the icons and you will get a pop-up explaining what this icon mean. We have also added symbols awareness so users can click on the thread name and link directly to the thread declaration. Same for entries where you can click on it and go directly to the definition source code of the selected thread. Another enhancement in the debugging experience is in the memory viewer. So now we have this great feature in the memory viewer, which gives us great visibility to the address space of RAM and flash. We added a feature where the symbol names for variables and functions are now clickable links that will direct you to the definition of these symbols. This covers, again, both flash and RAM, 
and when you highlight a variable or a symbol you have it color coded and you can know its address size and current index when applicable this is very useful in many debugging scenarios for instance let's say you have an array and you suspect some buffer overflow due to some poor boundary checking the memory viewer what it will show you it will show you neighboring symbols that are very likely to be causing the issue and the last feature that I want to highlight is the peripherals view. So in the previous releases of NRF Connect for VS Code, the peripherals view was a read-only representation of hardware peripherals. For this release, we have added write support to all writable registers, enabling the user to interact with the peripherals during a debug session. So we can see in this illustration here that we are able to change during the debugging session the hardware timer mode from timer to counter, fire some capture events. So the peripheral view give us, gives us a great visibility and control over the address space allocated for peripherals. And with that, I'll hand the floor to Tiago. So thanks, Ali, for the highlights on our developer tools and really great demo uh, as well. So now we'll go uh, into the SDK domain uh, where we have an update on the power uh, control. Uh, if you're using our NRF21540 front-end module um, uh, to boost your TX power, then you have the possibility to include a built-in uh, software power model on, uh, in the project for your target device, uh, which can be a NRF52 or NRF53 series device. The benefit here is that uh, you will get improved FEM power control um, as that uh, built-in power model brings the ability to compensate the gain for varying external parameters, um, namely temperature, carrier frequency, uh, FEM supply voltage, as well as input power. And here you can see one example uh, with the uh, TX gain at different carrier frequencies and over three different temperature points. And as you can see, the benefit of using the model is quite clear when uh, comparing the two graphs or the two plots. The right side uh, shows where the model was used. Um, and as you can see, the gain is much more consistent across uh, the parameters. Uh, whereas without the model, it can vary anywhere between 14 and 6 dB. So let's move now into security, uh, which is uh, an extremely important design consideration for IoT products. So the first update is related to PSA certifications. And for those of you who might not be familiar with PSA, it stands for Platform Security Architecture. And it offers a standardized approach for securing connected devices from the initial security analysis all the way to the certification. So we have obtained a new PSA level one certification for uh, uh, NRF uh, 52840, which combines the hardware with the NRF Connect SDK on the software side. Uh, this device was already certified with PSA level one, uh, but the software it was using was the NRF5 SDK. So these two certificates are now available in parallel and you can find them on the PSA certified product list. Uh, so if you have a need to use them for your end product certification needs, just make sure that you, you get the one uh, for the SDK that you have uh, developed your application on. So either the NRF5 SDK or the NRF Connect SDK. Uh, updates on uh, Trusted Firmware M, or TFM for short. Uh, so again, just a really quick intro here. TFM is a uh, PSA reference design uh, to implement secure applications uh, by having a non-secure and a secure processing environment with an isolation boundary in between them. And this um, protects the critical security assets in your product uh, such as you know sensitive data, uh, keys, or certificates, and and more broadly, this enables devices to become PSA certified. So we continue improving the um, ease of use around security within the NRF Connect SDK. And for this release, we have added a demonstration of PSA best practice on NRF fifty three forty and uh, NRF ninety one sixty using Trusted Firmware M. Uh, so there are two new samples in the SDK. Uh, first one is the provisioning image sample, uh, and it shows how to provision hardware keys to secure storage and transition through the security lifecycle states. And the second one is a TFM PSA template. So it's essentially a starting point for creating a secure application following PSA best practices 
and that combines TFM, uh, NRF Secure, Immutable Bootloader, and MCU Boot. So now I'll hand it back to Bjorn for updates on Ant. Okay, thank you, Tiago. I'll quickly go through the Ant updates on the NRF 5340. So in this release of NRF Connect SDK, we have added experimental ant support on the NRF 5340 SOC. Um, we have hosted two webinars. So we've been a part of two webinars uh, in the Garmin Developer Virtual Conference, the GDVC 2022. So the first one is an introduction to the NRF 5340 the benefits, and also an introduction to NRF Connect SDK. And the second one is more of a deep dive in how you can get set up with the NRF Connect SDK, how you can add the Ant repository, and it also showcases a demo at the end, how you can interface the NRF 5340 DK with a Garmin sports watch. Um, before I get to the demo, we do have a link to the Ant for NRF Connect SDK documentation. Do note that it does require you being an Ant adopter at the very least. And so in this demo, we'll send simulated HRM values from an NRF 5340 DK to an Ant connected watch. So without further ado, let's get started with the demo. In this demo, we're going to showcase sending simulated heart rate monitor values from an NRF 5340DK to a Garmin sports watch via Ant. So I've already flashed the HRMTX example um, to the NRF 5340DK. Now we'll just connect to the serial port. In this case, it's VCOM1. And here you can see the simulated HRM values. Let me just stop the terminal quickly. Here you can see 118, 114, etc. And let me start the terminal again. Good. And now what we can do is uh, search for this sensor. can add the sensor. Now you can see it's connected. And now what I'll do is start an activity. And here you can see the simulated HRM values. Back to Tiago now for Bluetooth updates. Thank you, Bjorn, for that update on Ant. So let's move now to the next topic, which is Bluetooth. So first thing to talk about is that we added experimental support for LE power control requests. So on the soft device controller, uh, there are HCI commands that enable a device to request a change in TX power from a peer device. On the right-hand side here, uh, we are uh, depicting the idea behind LE power control. So essentially, each device has an optimal RSSI range for incoming signals uh, that is commonly referred to as the golden range. So if the RSSI is either too high or too low, uh, then you can run into issues uh, such as saturation on the high side and, and just errors on the low side. That will lead to packet loss, you know, retransmissions, and you know, eventually more serious issues. You know, for example, just link loss, uh, where the connection drops, which will eventually be noticed by the end users. With the LE power control request, uh, the device can ask its peer device to decrease or increase the TX power, uh, depending on the RSSI value, so that it falls back into this uh, optimal uh, range, so-called golden range area. Moving to another feature, we added experimental support for periodic advertising sync transfer sending, or PAST for short. So if you have a periodic advertiser transmitter, and then you have two devices that want to sync to that transmitter, without this feature, uh, both of those devices will have to go through the periodic advertising synchronization process. Uh, what that means is that both of those devices have to scan the primary advertising channels 
until the transmitter sends the advertising packet with the periodic uh, advertising synchronization information. Uh, the synchronization process takes time and energy, so it's not ideal if you have uh, an energy-constrained device, uh, for example, a wearable, uh, which is battery-powered. With the feature, uh, the benefit here is that a device that has already synchronized with the transmitter can share the information with other devices, uh, which then allows them to sync uh, with the transmitter without having to go through the synchronization process. Uh, and then, of course, that allows them to save time and, more importantly, to save energy if they fall into the you know energy constraint category. So. Now, wrapping up the Bluetooth uh, portion, we also have some updates on Bluetooth Mesh. Uh, two things to highlight here. Uh, the first one is that we have um, added performance and reliability improvements. And specifically, what this means is that there is reduced latency and increased uh, relay throughput under high network loads. So what you will observe is that you know packets going between two mesh nodes will arrive faster, and there will be less packet loss along the way um, in the case where there's a lot of activity on the mesh network. And this was achieved by a change in the default advertiser implementation in the Bluetooth mesh subsystem uh, from add underscore legacy.c to add underscore x.c. And then we have also added a new vendor model for distance measurement. So this now allows measuring the distance between mesh devices on your network uh, utilizing the distance measurement library uh, under the hood. And at this stage, this feature has uh, experimental support level. And now moving to thread and matter. So the NRF Connect SDK now includes matter 1.0 support for thread and Bluetooth LE. Matter over thread support is no longer experimental, uh, meaning that customers can now develop matter compliant products and bring those to market. If you're interested in matter, then I highly recommend that you watch our webinar from November 25th on developing matter 1.0 products with NRF Connect SDK. You can find it on demand at webinars.nordxmi.com. And early next year, we'll have a webinar on how to go to market with Matter. So I encourage you to subscribe to our webinars so that you can join live and also ask questions and get your questions answered. So continuing with the highlights, uh, we have also improved the documentation around Matter with new sections covering OTA, multifabrics, and other topics. The Matter light switch sample now includes Wi-Fi support, uh, and that is in addition to threat support that was already in place. Uh, these two options are mutually exclusive, so they depend on the hardware that you have available. And now uh, we'll show you a Matter demo uh, showcasing interoperability between devices on different ecosystems, uh, as well as using both thread and Wi-Fi transports. Hey, if you are interested in smart home solutions, you likely heard about the Matter. The Nordic platform supporting Matter 1.0 uh, has been released in NRF Connect SDK 2.1.1. Uh, but it's over one month after official Matter 1.0 announcement. So, so ecosystem providers already updated their on-market devices uh, with the newest firmware enabling Matter support. Thus, nowadays, uh, testing Matter uh, has become easier than any other time before. We no longer need uh, using development environment uh, or some beta firmware versions. Uh, we can just do testing uh, based on the official uh, system releases uh, from the ecosystem providers. Today, I would like to uh, show you the bunch of possibilities uh, that it gives to the user. Uh, I have uh, on the table two Nordic DKs running uh, Matter light bulb sample application uh, based on NRF Connect SDK uh, 2.2.0. Uh, one device is NRF 50 to 840 DK uh, that is working over thread, uh, and the other is new Nordic uh, NRF 7002 DK uh, that supports Wi Fi technology. Uh, both are commissioned to the multiple ecosystems uh, thanks to the Matter feature called Multifabric uh, that ensures ecosystems uh, interoperability. The first ecosystem uh, is created by the uh, Apple HomePod Mini and Apple iPhone, uh, and the second is created uh, by the SmartThings Hub and uh, Android Phone with SmartThings application. All of these devices uh, are running uh, the official firmware without any uh, further modifications. Let's start from the matter over thread light bulb. Uh, take a look uh, on the LED2 of the board and see uh, that I can control the light bulb state from SmartThings app. It works. 
uh, and you can also see the status was updated in the uh, Apple Home app. Uh, I can do the same using uh, Apple Home app. Or I can change the light brightness using the slider. Uh, controlling works uh, in the same way uh, for the matter over Wi-Fi light bulb. Uh, so I can, for example, uh, turn it off using Apple and then turn it on using uh, SmartThings. Uh, that's pretty cool uh, because user doesn't even need to know uh, what technologies uh, are running underneath on the devices. It just works uh, in the consistent way. Uh, voice commands are also supported. Uh, so I can, for example, ask, Hey Siri, turn off all my lights. Yeah, it's also updated uh, in the SmartThings app. Uh, to get more information about uh, Matter protocol, uh, how to run a uh, matter light bulb sample uh, presented in this video or any other matter sample. Uh, see the RNF, NRF Connect SDK uh, documentation hosted on developer.nordicsemi.com. And next up is Wi Fi, uh, the newest offering in our product portfolio. We have added Wi Fi location in NRF Cloud Location Services, and uh, Bjorn will talk a little bit more about that in detail on the next section. We also added experimental support for target wait time, or TWT. And this feature allows the device to negotiate the sleep schedule with the Wi-Fi access point uh, so that it can spend more time in a sleep mode, uh, which will reducing, uh, end up reducing the radioactivity and, and therefore also the energy consumption. Uh, there are new Wi-Fi samples uh, added for radio testing, scan, station, and provisioning service. And we also added power saving to the Wi-Fi shell sample with the TWT support. If you're interested in, uh, in Wi-Fi, then I recommend that you subscribe to our newsletter and also feel free to get in touch with our sales team uh, to talk about your Wi-Fi needs and ask about sample availability. Uh, and now that we went through the Wi-Fi updates, it's time to show you a demo of the provisioning sample with the NRF Wi-Fi Provisioner mobile app. Okay, here I want to quickly show you the NF Wi-Fi provision app. Here I have a screen recording of my phone running the app. I also prepared in opening a hotspot for the DK to connect. So if I open the app, you will see a quick list of requirements. So you need the NF7002 DK and you need the flashed Wi-Fi provisioning sample. If I click here, you will see that one of those kits is already available. I can click on it and I will be asked to pair. Yes, I want to pair. No, you don't need access to your contacts and call history. Okay, click pair. And you will see that this DK does not have a Wi-Fi connection yet, so it's unprovisioned. I can start provisioning. And then I will see some Wi-Fi networks. This one is my hotspot, so I will click here, add my super secret password. And accept. And then I can select persistent storage or not persistent storage. This basically means if Wi-Fi provisioning data is going to be stored on the DK or not. So when it loses power or when I switch it on and off, will it still automatically provision itself or not. In this case, we want to store the data. And then I will click provision. This takes a bit. And then we will see everything worked, authentication, association, obtaining IP, and it's connected. Okay, if you click here on next device, you can provision more devices if you have more running. In this case, we don't. And let's check if it worked. So if I check my hotspot, I have one device connected. That is the DK. Good. Let me switch the DK on and off. And then we'll see if it auto reconnects. Okay, now the hotspot is still on, but no device is connected. 
if I restart the kit now, it might take some time for it to reconnect. So let's try it. Okay, kit is restarted. Let's see. And there the kit has auto reconnected. So everything worked out fine. That's the quick demo. You can get the app in the App Store or in the Google Play Store and try it for yourself. Thank you, Finn, for that great demo. Uh, let's head on over to the cellular IoT updates. Um, so we do have the complete low power cellular IoT solution. We have the NRF 9160 SIP with LTM, narrowband IoT, and GNSS support. Um, on the NRF Connect SDK side, we have the NRF Connect SDK. We have NRF Connect for desktop, uh, a set of uh, tools that you can use to make it easier to develop products. We also have NRF Cloud Services, which I'll discuss. And of course, we have the NRF9160 DK for development and the Thingy91 prototyping platform with a multitude of sensors. When it comes to the NRF Connect SDK overview, here you can see the NRF 9160. So we do have PMIC, passives and crystals and RF front end inside the SIP itself. We have an application processor and a separate uh, modem processor too. Um, so all you really need to add is battery, one or more sensors, uh, SIM card and one or multiple antennas based on your use case. Um, moving over to the NRF Connect SDK, you can see the modem firmware, uh, everything from the L1 to L3 LT layers up to TLS, DTLS that is inside the modem firmware, and that can be found on our website as a pre-compiled zip file. When it comes to the app core, uh, that's where NRF Connect SDK is running, everything from the modem library uh, to the protocols that we support, we support all of the major ones in addition to you know, various others, libraries and modules. And of course, we have a lot of applications and samples to help you get started. We also do have a carrier library. Some carriers require this. Um, and the way they talk is via IPC shared memory. So the modem core and the app core talk via IPC shared memory uh, between each other. When it comes to the cellular highlights, we have added support for Wi-Fi location in NRF Cloud Location Services. And we've also added experimental support for AS release assistance indication with lightweight machine to machine with a demo. Um, we have had support for AS RAI um, previously uh, with other protocols, but this is the first time we've added experimental support with lightweight machine to machine. Let's move on to Wi Fi location services. So, what you need is you, of course, you'll have an NRF 9160 and then you need some kind of uh, Wi-Fi scanning device. So for example, the NRF 7002. And what happens in uh, Wi-Fi locationing is that the device inquires its Wi-Fi network surroundings. So it looks for, it scans for ne nearby access points. Uh, the device then connects and sends the Wi-Fi details to the cloud by the LT network. And then the cloud then calculates the position of the device. Um, it does this by getting the location or calculating the location from wi a Wi-Fi database that has the location of various uh, access points in the uh, vicinity. And then last but not least, the cloud can then send the position to the device or it can of course be used elsewhere. Uh, one thing to note is you can also use NRF Cloud in a cloud-to-cloud -cloud use case where your device is connecting to a customer cloud and then that cloud then connects to NRF Cloud via the REST API. But either way, it will uh, the Wi-Fi locationing works. So here we can see a test drive that we actually did in Tampere in Finland. Um, here you can see the blue is multi-cell and the green is uh, GNSS. Uh, GNSS is more accurate than multi-cell. Um, and if we go to the next slide, here you can see Wi-Fi locationing versus GNSS. So you can see that the accuracy is quite a bit better 
for Wi-Fi based locationing. Uh, here we can actually see another uh, test drive also in Tampere. Here in blue you see multi-cell again and in red you see Wi-Fi based. And one thing to note is of course in city centers you will have you know multiple access points nearby. You can't expect to get accurate results. Um, so this is just to quickly highlight the different location services we provide, but also some of the similarities and differences, right? So of course, GPS based, so assisted GPS or predictive GPS, they do have higher accuracy than the other ones in this table, but they also require more current consumption. Um, so especially multi-cell and Wi-Fi, can they have medium to medium plus uh, accuracy, but they do have uh, better uh, power savings. But what I want to highlight here is that even though it seems from the charts before that Wi-Fi is better, um, you of course do need Wi-Fi access points. So if you're out in the countryside, uh, multi-cell might actually be better than Wi-Fi based locationing, whereas it can be the, the opposite in the city. So depending on the use case, um, you can mix and match different location services to suit your use case to get the best accuracy and essentially optimize both accuracy and power savings. When it comes to GPS versus assisted GPS and predictive GPS, we will post a DevZone blog post soon to compare and contrast. You can also check the slide before to compare and contrast AGPS versus PGPS. Um, in this blog post, we'll include PPK2 measurements and a video. We'll also showcase the time to first fix improvements and also the optimized current due to this with the PPK2. Um, during the registration for this webinar, if you checked, yes, I want to subscribe to webinar notifications, you will be notified via email. If you selected no, you can always go to this link and you can subscribe to get DevZone blog post updates. There's a button there on the main page. There's also on the button on the right hand side under every blog. If you want to learn more about our cloud services, just head on over to nordicsemi.com slash cloud services. Also check out nrfcloud.com. You can see our pricing. It's very transparent. Okay. Let's move on to AES release assistance indication for Lightweight Machine to Machine. Like already said, we have added experimental support in the Lightweight Machine to Machine client, but AES Ride does need to be supported on the cellular network. So for Norway, as of right now, we do have support both on Telia and Telenor on the narrowband IoT network. Um, so basically what AES RIDE does, it skips the network dependent RC inactivity timer, this portion here. So you're quickly able to switch from the RC connected mode here to idle PSM if there is no more data to send or receive. And here you are able to save a lot of power because without AES RIDE, the radio needs to stay on after he send receive in the RC inactivity timer. Um, if you want to enable AS RI, we have the AT RI um, comm AT command, and you can more information on the socket options here. So here we can see a quick example. This is on the NRF 9160 SIP on the Telenor network in Norway. So here you can see the beginning, you have the network in SimSync in yellow, roughly 5% of the total LT event charge. Uh, then you have the RSC setup getting connected to the network, roughly 22%. You can see the data here. So that in this case, 64 bytes of uplink data, that's only 3% of the total LT event. Then you have the CDRX in blue, these blue bars here, the RSC release, uh, here, uh, and then the idle DRX, and last but not least, uh, power saving mode, where we can see roughly 2.7 micro apps. Um, so the idea here is with um, ASRI enabled, uh, it will look like this. So you can get rid of this RC and activity timer. 
which means that you can get rid of most of the CDRX um, event. Uh, so not this one here, but in essence, you're almost uh, saving 60%, you know, up to 60% of the cost. One thing to note that I'm about to show you in the demo for the use case of not using ASRI, so ASRI disabled, you won't see these CDRX peaks. So instead, it will look something like this. And that is because the network as of right now does not support a CDRX. So the modem is always in RX mode. So the results are actually better than expected in the demo. So we see roughly 90% improvements, maybe a bit more, instead of the roughly 60% improvements in current consumption. And another thing to note is that your results will probably be different because your network will most likely have different network settings and parameters depending on which network you are using. But yeah, without further ado, let's get started with the demo. Okay, demo time. In this demo, I'm going to showcase an NRF9160DK over here with a Telenor SIM. We're running Narrowband IoT connected to a PPK2, so the Power Profiler Kit 2 running in source meter mode. And what we'll show is a demo of sending a UDP packet with out ASRI, so ASRI disabled first, and then afterwards ASRI enabled. Um, and if we take a quick look at the graph, what we should then be able to see in the Power Profiling app is the network simsync, RSC setup, data transfer, then the RSC connected. After the RSC release, we'll actually go directly into power saving mode. So you won't see the RSC idle phase. And of course, we'll be able to see it with RSC connected and without when ASRI is enabled. So let's get right to it. Um, in NRF Connect for desktop, either download it if you don't have it or open it, and then you can open the Power Profiling app. I already have this running, and now you can see switch two is switch set to the right. So now we'll actually send a UDP packet. And you should be able to see that here. You can see the beginning portion there, network simsync, and then the uh, RC connected phase. Now let's switch over, switch two to the left. And what now will happen, a network reconnect, reconnection phase will happen before the first UDP packet will be sent and ASRI will be enabled. Then what I'll do once it's going back into PSM mode, I will press button one one more time. So let's do that. And now you can see this is with ASRI enabled. So let's take a quick look at those results. So you can see over here, if we go back to the chart, this is without ASRI. So you can see the first portion, the network and SimSync. You can see the RSC setup over here, also with the data transfer, and then this long phase here. So basically from here, if I hold down Shift, I can uh, highlight a portion. This whole portion is the RSC connected, so this part here. And you can see that's, you know, 9.9 .9 seconds. Uh, you can see the last peak, that is the RSC release. Um, before we would then go back uh, into the PSM mode. So that is that. We can take a quick look. If I hold down Shift again, we can see that that takes 11.5 seconds, 345 millicoulomb charge. So this was the first scenario. Now we'll take a look at the scenario number two. So that is over here. And now we can actually see 1.6 seconds instead of, you know, 10 seconds and 24.4 millicoulombs. 
So in the second scenario, you're getting rid of the RC connected. It's going directly. If we zoom in. You can again see the network sim sync. You can see the RC setup data. But after the data, it goes directly to RC release and then it goes back into PSM mode where you're consuming 1.8 uh, microamps. So it's a huge improvement if your network does support ASRI, it can definitely be worth it um, to save, in this scenario, roughly 90% of the current consumption. That was the ASRI demo. Um, moving on quickly to supported modem firmware. As of right now, the latest version is version 1.3.3. More information there. You can also download it. We also have a compatibility matrix, which basically shows which modem firmware has been tested with which NRF Connect SDK version. We also have more information on certification here, if you click on that link. Um, tools for saving power. We have the online power profiler for power profiling estimates. Uh, we have the PPK2, um, which I highlighted in the demo more information on the link and you can also buy it there and also a great power optimization guide. So that was it for now. If you enjoyed this webinar, uh, feel free to head over to webinars.nordicsemi.com to register for new webinars. We have an intro to cellular IoT course over at academy.nordicsemi.com. So if you wanna get started with that, head over there. Um, if you need tech support, head over to devzone.nordicsemi.com. And otherwise, if you want to learn more about our products and services, that's at nordicsemi.com. Let's head on over to the Q&A now. Okay, great. Um, we have a lot of questions. Um, Ali, do you want to start? Absolutely. So uh, the first question that I see here is, does Bluetooth LE audio have data encryption? And the answer is yes. It's the, in, the encryption is the same as uh, Bluetooth LE. It's 128-bit AES. You want to take the next question, Bjorn? Um, yeah, sure. So let's see, can Bluetooth LE audio work in no Artos firmware? So without an Artos, um, technically yes, but this is not a part of our offering. So we focused on the, on using the Zephyr Artos for all of the samples. Cool. I'll take the next question. It's a question related to Kconfig. So how to define a macro definition of a specific name? You basically need to uh, create a kconfig uh, file where you define the kconfig symbol or macro, macro, specify its type, Boolean string, and then set its default state. We have a dedicated uh, exercise on Dev Academy. So check lesson three, exercise two of an out of connect SDK fundamentals on Dev Academy. Okay, great. Should I, uh, let's see how to send non-audio data over Bluetooth LE audio. So the ACL connection that's used to control data. So volume muting, for example, uh, can be used with non-audio data, but the LE audio profiles, are, they're GAT profiles as most of the other Bluetooth LE profiles. Okay, I'll take the next one. Uh, why does Zephyr prohibit build project in folder outside the SDK route? This is not prohibited and you can actually build applications outside the SDK route. And um, if you check our uh, NRF Connect uh, for Visual Studio Code extension, it's one of the options is to create um, an application based on a sample and then you can specify where outside the route you can uh, build the application. And the next question I can also answer, I'm currently working with the NRF9160 and I'm using uh, NRF JPROG or the JLink libraries directly. Is the goal of the NRF Util CLI is to kind of replace these tools or as a supplement? So there is no harm of using NRF JPROG or JLink libraries directly. However, NRF Util provides a more convenient to, way to program all Nordic devices, whether uh, there is a debugger or it's, uh, it has uh, MCU boot uh, support or it's, it has the 
uh, an RF5 uh, bootloader. It's one utility that can program all of these devices with different programming capabilities. And it also has these cool stuff like auto completion. So you no longer have to uh, type the serial number yourself. You just hit tab and it also fill it for you. And then the next works question I can also tackle, why do you need a YAML file? So YAML file, the files, it's, they are like, they, they're called device binding and they basically define the compatible property. So it's like the type, if you, if you kind of like link it to C, it's the thing that define the type. And when you define the type or the compatible property, it declares the requirement on the content of the device tree and provides semantic information about the content of valid nodes. And uh, every device uh, tree node must have a compatible. And again, we have a, uh, a dedicated lesson in Dev Academy in the NRF Connect SDK fundamentals course, and that's lesson two. So if you want to learn more about YAML files and how they link into device tree, check lesson two of NRF Connect SDK fundamentals, and they go in depth for that. Okay, great. Uh, that just reminded me, I wanted to quickly say, uh, so regarding the blog post I mentioned on uh, GPS versus assisted GPS and predicted GPS, uh, you can also, so either you can subscribe to our webinars email list, but you can also subscribe to DevZone directly. So if you just go to devzone.orgsemi.com, then you click on the blogs, uh, there's a button there. I know it all, the button's also available on all of the blogs on the right-hand side. So that might be good to know. Um, I have a good question here from the uh, chat. Um, how so regarding asri how to find out whether that's supported on a given ltm network um, while targeting a global use case um, do you maintain an overview of tested networks so we do have an overview but this is yeah this is testing done by us it's uh internal use um i'm not sure what the plans are there um regarding you know having some kind of a table or something like that um you might be aware that both iBasis and Arkesa have a coverage map uh, table uh, with uh, PSM values, for example. We don't have ASRI by now, uh, for now, but uh, it is definitely something we could maybe consider uh, later on. But again, the ASRI it is quite early stages. And like I mentioned, at least in Norway, it's only Tele on Telenur. So the two main operators, they support it on narrowband IoT as of right now. So I think if you, yeah, if you wait a few more months, there's probably more information, but sorry for the long winded answer, but basically uh, it should be, you have to ask your operator. That's, that's the simple answer. Sorry. Um, let's see, we have another question. Okay. So there's one good question here, actually. Um, we have an important NRF91 project based on NRF Connect SDK, but using an old revision. Uh, it's based on the command line before, but now you he the person wants to use NRF Connect for VS Code. Um, will our project still be compatible with the latest version of VS Code? If yes, how would I start importing? Um, this sounds more like a dev zone question, to be honest, uh, because there are a few factors that you need to uh, think of. I'm pretty sure VS Code, so the NRF Connect for VS Code is supported as of version 1.6 of the NRF Connect SDK. But you also need to check whether it's, you know, Rev, uh, if it's Rev 1 or Rev 2 of the NRF 9160 silicon, et cetera. So there are a few things to consider there. So I would definitely ask a question on DevZone instead. And one of our engineers can help you out there. Um, yeah, and there's one more here. Are there plans for more samples or guides for provisioning of keys certificates for the NRF 9160? Uh, the new provisioning sample is great, but provisioning seems like one problem that I always have trouble solving in a robust way. Um, it's so we are working hard um, to make this better. Um, if you do have any specific requests for what you want, uh, we definitely recommend, you know, provide feedback on DevZone. So I can't really say much more about that, but if you provide feedback, we'll take a look at that and uh, see what we can do with it. 
Ali, do you want to? Okay, it's ten o'clock now. Do you want to take one last question before I'll I compress two questions in one? Okay. So, so it's um, they're both related to NRFutil, and the questions are: Can NRFutil be used to program the NRF ninety one sixty modem for firmware? And the answer is yes, it can. And also, can NRFutil be used to, with custom devices? And I think by that you mean like custom boards, which are a Nordic uh, kind of like powered or Nordic uh, based. And the answer is also yes. Okay, great. I see there's one here in the chat quickly. Can you say anything about NRF 7002 based modules availability? Um, yeah, that's more roadmap. Uh, I would check back soon. Check on our website. So in general, if you just check on our website, you go to the product page and you press the buy button, you can see all of our distribu distributors that have uh, products in stock. That's probably the easiest way. Um, before I stop i just quickly want to upload the uh the um, pdf of the presentation uh just in case you want that if you want to click on some links so you should have gotten that now um yeah that is all we have from now sorry that we didn't have any more time um to answer questions uh, like I said at the end, you know, if you have more questions, feel free to go to DevZone, uh, check out the Academy, check out the NRF Connect SDK release notes, etc. Um, yeah, and and also subscribe to more webinars. So thank you so much, Ali, for your help, and also to Tiago. Yeah. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.